Right now, in my gravity flyer, I build an amazing field around it. Now, I want to show you in today's video exactly how I got there. The steps that I took in the beginning, the things that I've noticed, the things that I had to change, and exactly how it came about. So, let's get to some testing, let's take a look at everything, and let's see exactly how we made these big, beautiful fields around this gravity flyer. We're doing a little testing right now. So what I have connected is real simple here. There's my ZVS, there's my flyback, and they're connected all up. My motors are running fairly slow. Here's what my motor speeds are right now, or my what I'm putting into them. This is my upper one right here, 7.08, bottom one 13.3. And I did separate them for this test because I'm noticing something that's going on here. Now, I do have my Tesla coil hooked up right now. And we are looking at 15.2 on that right now. So there's nothing really going on. Okay. So, let's see if we can get our Tesla coil to spark up a little bit. And there it is. Pretty clear Tesla coil is on, so you can see that. Now I want you to focus in right here. That's my high voltage, it's on. Now, I'm gonna turn my Tesla coil up, and I'm gonna get it right in the range of 30 volts to go in. You see that right there? That little bit of sparkage is going on right there now. The Tesla coil is interacting with my high voltage coil. So let's look at this in a different way. Our Tesla coil is connected to the center plate of our gravity flyer. Our high voltage coil is connected to the upper plate in our gravity flyer. The high voltage coil is not producing enough energy out of it to make it spark at this point. So. What's going on? Well, our Tesla coil is producing a field around it. And as the center plate of our gravity flyer is now our toroidal on our Tesla coil, we can now see that the field itself pushes into the upper plate. Now we have a field interaction. In that reaction, we're not getting a violent voltage out of this. We're getting a very mild voltage out of this which is very important when you go to build a field. You don't necessarily want something that reacts in a violent way. You want it to work together, but you also want it to produce more energy than each field can produce individually. That's why this little test is important. Don't know if it's leakage from the white wire there, I doubt it. But it's the Tesla coil frame to the Tesla coil to the frame itself. So we're definitely on there. We're definitely on there. So, what are we getting right there? A little bit. You can't see a whole lot, but it's right there. It just sparks over now. So, we're, we definitely have a connection when the Tesla coil gets that high to go over. And I'll just show you here. I got the wire in there. And there's absolutely no spark over because I'm not running it at a real excessive rate like I was before. So I just want to show you that it's having an effect not only on the center plate, it's having an effect on the top and bottom disc as well. Let's see if we can get a picture. Yeah, it's right there. So let's see if I can get this without getting myself zapped here. see it. Every once in a while, now it's sparking over. It wasn't doing that before. Watch. I'll turn off the Tesla coil. It'll stop. Okay, my Tesla coil is now at 19. I got no spark over. Go back up to the top. Nope, nothing there. So, we definitely have a connection between 
or Tesla coil in the upper and bottom plate along with the center plate when you go too high on the Tesla coil itself. Again, I like to run it at about 25. 30, I'm starting to affect the uh, high voltage circuit now. There's one other thing that was really significant in this test, and it'll keep coming up again and again. Let's take our fluorescent tube and let's put it next to our Tesla coil. In the bottom, we're running at normal oscillation. In the top four inches, it seems to be something different. As you see, the actual fluorescent tube gets brighter. There's a reason for that. It's actually running at a different frequency than the rest of my Tesla coil. It's actually running at 20 Hertz. Now that we've seen our first test, let's understand this a little bit better. I know I explained it a little bit, but let me do some more. What we're trying to do is get two fields to interact together. Now, as they build, you're going to get one outer field, so you get this big bubble. Now, you want a secondary field that grows inside of that to go right up against it. And what you're trying to do is have that field move it or interact with it. Probably both. What you're going to find is the field itself will push it and then this field will interact with it. What you get is they come together. As they come together, you're going to produce more energy than each one individually. So that's very important when you're building a field. The first test we saw there may seem so simple, but it's a very good indicator that we're going to be able to put these fields together. So let's move on from here. We're going to go ahead and look at the sounds of our gravity flyer now. We're going to put a microphone next to it and see what's going on. There's some interesting things that you've already seen with the Tesla coil on where it's lighting up at. Now let's investigate that a little further. So we're doing a little more testing. This right here is a test on each part of the gravity flyer along with the Tesla coil. I will tell you, listen to underneath the gravity flyer because there is hardly any sound and above it's way noisy. And then the Tesla coil has a spot where you'll hear plenty of sound and absolutely no sound. So there's definitely something going on here. This test is testing the sound on this. As you see, we test the upper disc. We want to see exactly what it sounds like. Then we test the lower disc, and we want to see what that sounds like. Again, two different motor speeds, two different sounds coming off. The frequencies are different for both. Now, you also see that we're getting vibration in the entire gravity flyer. Then, we show that the center plate is now connected to a wire that goes straight down the top of our Tesla coil. As you can see here, when we did the hearing part of it, you can hear the bottom portion. The top portion, however, appears to have no sound. Well, it may appear that way, but it's still putting off a frequency. It's putting off 20 hertz. What's the significance of that? The fact is, it's not supposed to be doing it. Tesla coils are supposed to oscillate from top to bottom. They're not supposed to change frequencies. However, running it in this configuration changes the frequency. 
in the top portion of our Tesla coil. James from Tech Planet just sent me this review of the audio on my Grabby Flyer. I thought it was important to share it with everybody. So here you go. Awesome video. Hey there, Nathan. It's James. And I just wanted to show you a couple things with the audio analysis that I did of your Gravi Flyer. So the first thing you'll notice is there is a drop off um, at around 18,000 hertz. And I think that's just because of your microphone. It doesn't receive any higher signal than that. These other frequencies are just your voice uh, talking over the Gravi Flyer. And my voice is not included in this analyzer. But there is something interesting going on with your Tesla coil in the silent zone. And it, it's, a, it's still producing sound at around 20 hertz. And it's actually producing quite a bit in that zone. Made it break down a little bit closer. This is your top plate. Nothing is really peaking too crazy. I noticed 120 hertz peak right there and maybe something at around 300. Um, and then it's something that, you know, there's a little bit of peak at 1000, but nothing really too crazy. I slowed it down here just in case you wanted to pause it and look what the frequency spectrum is. This one's your lower plate and it has a similar sound pattern to your upper plate. Uh, this this uh, software is called Span. Um, it's a VST software and I ran it in Reaper. Okay, so here is your Tesla coil. Now, this is your voice in the higher frequency ranges, but at 20 hertz, the lowest one right to the left here, is where something is going on. It's cutting out all the noise, but it's producing something at 20 hertz. It's peaking there. I would say maybe 18 to 20 hertz. The analysis you just heard from James from Tech Planet is very important. Let's unpack this a little bit. What we're getting is our top plate is running at 20 hertz or 1200 RPM. Our max on our upper plate at 12 volts on a fan motor is 1400 RPM. Now, my microphone itself only goes as low as 20 hertz. So he says it could be a little lower, down to 18 hertz. Now you could say, let's get a better microphone and get it accurate. How do I know that it's fairly accurate now? Well, it's a very simple thing. We know the RPM of the upper plate. Does it tie in to the top four inches of my Tesla coil? That's probably the most significant thing here. What you're gonna find in later testing in this is that it does tie in. It is an exact match. The frequency that's going on in our upper RPM at 20 Hertz will translate directly into our Tesla coil. All the testing will start to show that. We're gonna show a beat frequency coming from it. There's another part of this that I want you to understand. I've shown it a lot of times my 3D printer and how it resonates. And a lot of people out there understand this, but some people don't. And I show a little graph in this and it shows where it hits the single points and where they are. Now I want you to understand my motors are running really slow and I have various points in my center plate that are going to become the resonance frequency. It's more than one. There's going to be about six or seven in there. I usually identify six that are the main ones. This is very important going forward here. He mentioned in there that there's various frequencies going on. Again, my gravity flyer is running at a very low speed. Therefore, the frequencies that are going to happen in the center plate are going to reflect some of the speeds that are going on in my discs themselves. So you're going to get very low frequencies. I'll show the comparison test to my 3D printer that resonates. What you're going to find is, is those same things because those motors are running real slow and my motors are running real slow. You're going to start to see the same kind of frequencies pop up. It's very significant when you understand what's going on in your center plate versus what's going on in your Tesla coil. It's going to tie in in a big way for everything. Let's get back to the testing. Let me break this down a little further for you. We're going to start looking at some of the beats that are going on between the actual RPM of the motor, what's going on with the Tesla coil, and how they light up the fluorescent light. Let's go ahead and get into that. This test is going to be my 3D printer resonating. 
I'm showing it because it's a known point of resonance. Therefore, I can extrapolate how my center plate of my gravity flyer is going to work. Now let's identify the exact frequency that there are. 155 hertz, 246 hertz, 272 hertz, 439 hertz, 586 hertz, 844 hertz. Let's go back real quick to James for Tech Planet. Let's listen to some of the numbers he puts in here for our actual gravity flyer. Made a breakdown a little bit closer. This is your top plate. Nothing is really peaking too crazy. I noticed 120 hertz peak right there and maybe something at around 300. Um, and then it's something that, you know, there's a little bit of peak at 1000, but nothing really too crazy. I slowed it down here just in case you wanted to pause it and look what the frequency spectrum is. This one's your lower plate, and it has a similar sound pattern to your upper plate. It makes more sense now when you look at it in this way. We know that at low RPM, we create a resonance on our center disc, and we have various points where it actually amplifies it. Now, you see it in our center plate. It's not hitting the exact same frequency, but what it's doing is showing the same thing. In this aluminum, we're getting a resonance pattern. In that pattern is our resonance frequencies. Now, we are going to have to amplify those later on. It's important to identify how we're actually getting them. He says upper and lower plate. What I think is really going on here is we're getting the center plate resonance patterns. That's important to amplify later. It'll come into later testing. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to take out the fluorescent bulb and I'm going to bring it up to the top disc and bottom disc. And I just want you to notice when it turns on and when it doesn't. And the actual speed of the disc is going to change and it's going to change the vibration in the center plate. And what's going on is I get a better uh, light up on the bulb in certain places when I set the disc to certain speeds. So it's kind of important to look at the test, see when it's lighting up, when it doesn't light up at all, things like that. And then at the end, I'll show you the motor speed that I got the perfect uh, field out of. And it started to go into a vibrational state, which is what you saw a little earlier. Anyway, let's take a look at the test. So you heard me just say in there that it lights up the light better. So why is it doing that? I'm hitting a amplification point. In my center plate, I'm resonating at a certain frequency. As that matches parts of my Tesla coil that are at the same, what I'm getting is an amplification point, so the light gets brighter. Now that we understand frequency patterns, we see that we're changing those in our Tesla coil as well. Things are starting to come into our Tesla coil that normally shouldn't be there. We should have one frequency, right? Should oscillate back and forth. That's normally how a Tesla coil works. By putting the wire down the center of the Tesla coil, it's been changing frequencies. So what is it doing? It's taking the frequencies from our center plate and putting them into our Tesla coil. Now, let's go ahead and move on to fields. We're gonna start looking at our high voltage versus our Tesla coil. We need to create the fields around this thing. So now that we know how we resonate, we know where we have amplification points, let's go ahead and see if we can get the fields to work together now. We're gonna see exactly how I saw this and how I saw creating this bubble works. In order to understand the fields and how we get to static volts, let's review a little bit. This is our DC flyback circuit. It is a ZVS and it's a flyback transformer. I want you to take a look at the bottom spark here you see on our gravity flyer. It right now is a big spark. This is what you get when you normally just put in 12 volts, 3 amps into a ZVS that goes to a flyback. You're going to get a spark that looks like this. So how do we turn this into something that we can actually get a static volt out of? This right here is the same setup, but instead of 12 volts and 3 amps, 
I change it to 12 volts and now I have milliamps going in. What does it do? It creates the plasma spray that you're seeing right here. It's important to understand what amps do to this circuit. More amps means it clings to something. It'll stay beholden to it. When you actually remove some of the amps, what happens? It now makes the energy free flowing and it creates more of a static volt, something that can be moved. And that's what we really want here. As we know now, we're creating a static volt. So let's take our static meter and let's see exactly how much we're getting. As you can see, we're getting negative on the bottom and then we'll get positive on the top and in between the two, we're getting a different reading. We'll either get negative or positive. And right now we're showing slightly positive. What is that telling you? It's basically telling you that there's a field that's pushing out from that disc itself that's rotating. It's pushing out a little bit. This is what static volts do. This is what happens when you start removing amps from these voltages. They actually start to expand a little bit. Let's keep in mind right now that the only thing connected to this is the high voltage circuit from our flyback to the upper and lower disc. Now we understand the static is pushing as we rotate it. In this test, I wanted to see exactly what would happen when you take your Tesla coil and connect it to the top and bottom disc. What I did was I ran it from the very top all the way from the top disc all the way down my Tesla coil and all the way through and back to the bottom disc. What I want you to understand is the beat rate that's going on. Look how fast the actual thing is pulsing here. You can see it in the light. And then when you go to the bottom, it'll start to slow down. So let's take a look at this at night. As you can see, we're going to our top and it's a really rapid pulse. Now when we put this at the bottom, you notice that it slows down quite a bit. This is a very interesting phenomena. Again, fast on the top. It slows down on the bottom. What is this telling us? It tells us it's actually put out in a beat frequency when we run it in this way. Now we don't have any high voltage connected to this, just to test the coil. Earlier, we were talking about our sound and what is it doing to our Tesla coil? What is the RPMs of the motor doing to our Tesla coil? What we're seeing in this is something very clear. How do I know it was close to around 20 hertz? I can actually see the beat frequency in the discs themselves in the Tesla coil. As the Tesla coil is now connected directly to the motors, you can see that the motors are influencing the Tesla coil right in that same top four inches. So now we see exactly what we're looking at. We have a interconnection here. If we connect the Tesla coil to the top and bottom plates, we are now seeing different frequencies being put directly into our Tesla coil from this. Now we have no high voltage connected to this. That's going to be a big difference when we go to change that as well. But for now, you can really start to see this. We have something that's an interaction point, and you have to take notice of those every time that they happen. We can recognize this, and now we can amplify this. That's exactly where we're going to go from here. Now that we look at everything, we're starting to get a beat frequency that matches with our Tesla coil. The actual sound of the Hertz is matching with our Tesla coil. We're starting to build this thing. We're starting to understand a little more. But at this point, we need to amplify things. Now, I know a lot of this is low power, but we have to find our limits when we do this stuff. We have to push each field to their limit and see where they can go what the circuits can do themselves. It's very important that you do this. If you don't, you don't know exactly how far you can maneuver each thing. So we're just gonna build a framework right now. We're just looking at, we see the interaction points, 
We want to build a little more of the framework out. We want to see exactly how far we can push things, how much we can reduce things, where the interaction points are. Guys, every time we come up with an interaction point, it becomes a very significant thing. It's telling us something. It's telling us a story. It's up to us to see that story. It's up to us to see exactly which steps to take beyond this. And you can't do that unless you start pushing things. So let's go ahead and take some time and let's just push it. Let's just see what we can do. Let's make this field a little bigger than it should be. Let's make the high voltage a little crazier than it should be. And then we'll rain it back down to where we need to be. So let's just have a little fun right now and let's push this thing. Okay, let's set up this experiment for you. What we have connected right now is our high voltage is connected. One single flyback is connected right now, but my Tesla coil is on. Now, I only have 15 volts in my Tesla coil right now, and my high voltage field is on. And what you're seeing here is that the lights are lighting up all over the place. The two fields are interconnected. I showed in another video that that's where we were is our field is interconnected. Now, as I turn up the Tesla coil, it, it pushes the field out further. So, I can only use so many volts in the Tesla coil. So, at this point, even though it's only 15 volts, I'm running the risk of overvolting it in this whole experiment. Again, this is uh, conventional running with the high voltage going in the center too and my actual Tesla coil going on the outside or to the center plate. As you can see, the field itself is magnificent. It pushes out pretty far. We're getting a lot of high voltage spark over though. So let's take a look at this a little more in depth. With the high voltage in the center on the two plates, and the Tesla field on the outside. What is that doing? Well, the Tesla field's moving out, but we're not moving the high voltage on the plates at all. It's only going in a simple little area right around those plates. So there's no field interaction here. Now, when I tell you there's 15 volts connected to this, understand, I usually run the wire down my Tesla coil and not connect it to anything. In this particular case, I have 15 volts from my Tesla coil on the number two coil directly connected to the center plate. It right now is pushing out everything. So you can see it, it pushes out a great distance. I guess one of the questions would be, can you push it out even further? And the answer is yes. I can hit 40 volts, no problem on this thing and push this thing about 20 feet. But I want to watch something right now. We're about to hit another interaction point right there. I just turned the high voltage up. Now that's the high voltage that goes under both plates now. Again, you can see it sparking hard on the bottom. What is it actually doing? It's taking away from the actual field that my Tesla coil is putting off. It's pulling it into it. Again, remember when I told you that amps have a funny way of working on your project, that they actually pull things into it? Well, the high voltage there actually pulled the actual Tesla field in. So when you run too many amps, you run the risk of pushing it in or pulling it in. I'm sorry, pulling it in. It's pulling in that field instead of pushing it out. So we just have to note that in what we're doing. So I'd like to run things a little unconventional and I'll do that here in a little bit, but in a more conventional way of running this with a high voltage field on the inside and the Tesla coil on the outside, you saw an interaction point. Please keep that in mind when you're building this project. Now, do we want that many amps and anything in high voltage when we do this? Absolutely not. We're looking more for static. However, you can see that it did that. Now this right here, I'm gonna show you, we can get some distance out of this. So I'm actually just moved it. Now you see there's a lot of metal out there. It could be interacting with the metal. Guys, however you wanna see it, 
it's still pushing the field quite a bit out. Now there's some more cleaner tests that I can do, but let's take a look. Right now, 39 inches, just past three feet on 15 volts. That's pretty good. You know what? Right now, let's go ahead and change it up a little bit and let's hit some more high voltage in this and let's see what it does. Let's see if we can't get another interaction point. So today I'm doing some testing on some high voltage on this and I'm trying to set up for a lift test and it's not going so well so far but this is the beginning of it we're just testing where we're at we have negative to the bottom plate and positive to the center plate so as you can see we're barely getting the voltage to rip a little bit the one thing I want to show you in this experiment is how it moves to the center. So give it a minute. There it goes. It started. Let's see if we can't start it again. There it is. Now it's not actually on those bolts. It's just on the plate there. And it'll move in and out. Okay. As you can see, I moved the plate up quite a bit. Just so we all understand this, I have the positive to the center plate and negative to the bottom plate. It's causing a very weird thing to happen. The magnets themselves in the eddy current, I don't know if it's forcing it or not, but it's forcing it down to touch the bolt that holds in the fan. Now, obviously, we know electricity goes to the shortest distance possible. So it should try to contact the upper disc before it touches that bolt at all. I wanted to show this because it's just an anomaly that I ran into. And I'm not sure what's causing it yet. Okay, since I blew out my magnet on the last one, I took them off. And before I ran anything again, I ran this test again. So you could see kind of some of the voltage going on. There's no Tesla coil on on my top plate right here. This is all from the bottom plate and what it's doing. So, you can see it swirling in the center there. And you can see it sparking on, on the brush right there. So, there's definitely uh, an interconnection going on there. You see it just dances around. And that's without the magnet. So, the magnet probably had no effect of it going to the center. It just likes to go to the center. So, that, that was interesting. Okay, so we set up again this time. I'm not running any magnets on it again. And I'm just trying to get the field to go. What I did was I reversed the field. Negative to the center plate and positive to the bottom. Let's see what the result is in the change. I can see the field coming on right there. I know you probably can't see it all that well right now. I'll turn off the lights in a minute, but I just, I'm setting it right now and I'm changing exactly how many amps go into it. And there we go. I switched off the lights. You can see the field now. Apparently, this only works in one way. Negative to the center plate, positive to the rotating plate. So as you can see, the field looks pretty good. We're getting a strong reading out of it. Anyway, I, I think this is one of the best you can see right there. I'm, I just turned it up just a hair. Right there. You see all that white in there. I still got way too many amps in this thing. But when I'm moving it back and forth, it, I'm adjusting the amount of amps that go into it. You need just enough for push, not enough to do this, though. This is kind of bad. Makes cool looking effects, but ultimately kills the effect going into the center plate for charging. Let's take a look around this, see if we don't, we can't see the effect a little better. As you can see, just so you know, 
the outside is cut with jagged edges and what you'll notice is the spark develops right on that jagged edge and it goes on to the center disc there and because the center disc has more size to it or more mass it uh it always goes towards it so you can see as they just start to spark off a little bit every single one of them doing it and you see it in great detail on this one it has to be jagged on the edge to pull this effect off. If it's smooth, it, the effect doesn't come out. So at this point, you're probably wondering, what am I doing here? You, I, I told you all the time, I don't want to use high voltage in this. I want to use more of a static volt. Well, it's important to understand which way fields are moving. We're trying to manipulate fields here. So... In order to do that, you're going to have to put the power to a maximum level or a good level so that you can see any type of interaction that's going on. Are we pushing fields out? Are we pulling them in? What's causing them to come in? What's causing them to push out? What I'm noticing in this is when you change the polarity between positive and negative, it's actually making a difference. We saw the voltage come in when we put the positive to the center plate and negative to the bottom plate. We saw it actually change when you put negative to the center plate, positive to the bottom, you get the field that you're seeing here. And it, and it pushes out. So again, we're looking at moving fields. So there's going to be a lot to unpack in this, in exactly how we do it. What I'm seeing in this, guys, is that by changing different things, by changing which field goes where, I can move this thing wherever I want to, and I can do it with accuracy. Now I can take a field and move it in. I can move it out based on what we're learning here. What I noticed is the Tesla coil has to be connected to the top and bottom disc on this in order to move that high voltage field. So now we're going to have to do some testing in this in order to prove that theory to be true. Now I know we just looked at a lot of testing. So let's unpack this a little bit. What I'm looking for is where I can move a field. I want one field to be able to move the other. Now we looked at it and we saw the high voltage on the inside where we put it on the top and the bottom plate and we run the Tesla coil on the outside. The only way that it pulled it in is if we use a high amount of amps on the inside. What did I find? Well, in taking that, we went to the high voltage testing on it. Let's put high voltage on it and let's change some arrangements and let's see if we can actually get anything good out of it. The answer was no. It did not produce the field on the outside because the top disc by itself cannot put enough field around the whole craft with the Tesla coil. So it busts that whole thing. In order to get the effects we were getting, we had to change between the center plate and the bottom plate. So what did that do? Ruined our Tesla coil field. I have a lot of complaints about it. And you heard me probably voice that. Look, I'm trying to make two fields work together. I can't have a point where it doesn't work at all. So we actually saw what if you put the Tesla coil directly connected to the center plate. We can see that overpowers it, and we actually get a field that pushes out very far. What are we not getting when we do that? We're not getting the correct interaction point. We can see when we have to put so many amps in there just to pull the field back a little bit. You say, well, can you turn it down anymore? Guys, my Tesla coil turns on at about 12 to 15 volts. That's where it goes, that's where it starts the oscillation. That's where it has to go. So at any point, connecting it directly overpowers it. So where does that leave me? I now need to create something out of this. What worked the best? Well, when we take our Tesla coil and we connect it to the top plate, we run it through our Tesla coil, not attached directly, but just through the center of our number two coil, and we bring it around the bottom. Now I have two fields. Those fields now can push out and expand, just like this. They can create a beat rate, they can expand just like this on top and bottom. I now have two toroidals. 
That's exactly what I want. No matter how you look at it, that's what I want. Now, the center plate is now my high voltage. This is how we get that field. Now, what happens? Since the center plate is connected to the whole rest of it, you're basically looking at a shape here that goes around like this and through the center. Kind of like an H with curves. So, you have a turtle on top and bottom. Now I have an outer field here. Now, can I take that and move this? So, what will happen initially is because it's so low in amps, we're going to push the field out. Then we have to bring it back to a point where it will actually try to push back into it. That's our interaction point. So I want, again, let me just explain this, the high voltage on the center plate here is going to push out from the Tesla fields, the top and the bottom toroidal. They're going to force that out. Now, what I'm looking for is the high voltage to fight back a little bit. I want it to pull in a little bit because I want an interaction point there. So what's the whole point of the interaction point? I want to create something that is a higher amount. I want to make an over unity effect here. I want to make this thing have a voltage that works together. And as you can see, these voltages are working together. They're not fighting each other in a violent way. I'm not getting a super high voltage spark out everywhere. That's what normally you would see if you put two different voltages together. But because they're so alike, because you can create them in the exact same way with the exact same circuit, it makes them very much interactable. Now, this is why everything ties in together, guys. What I want this field to do is something very simple. I just want it to pulse. <laughs> Sounds simple, right? Pulse it. That's all I want it to do. I want a field that interacts at a level that will break from normal gravity. In order to do that, I have to create a point where they come together and they make interactions. But I also need the thing to pulse at one rate together. So this next amount of testing I'm going to show you here is exactly where we're going with this, guys. You're going to start to see I'm forming the field. I'm getting it to where I want to. I found the points where it goes too far. Now I need to rein it in. Let's bring it in and let's form this field so we can manipulate this thing exactly the way we want to. This next part of the testing is so important where you start to see it. Let's get into that. Okay, I'm looking for a little bit of field test. So you're going to see the light turn on. You're going to see it blink. What I'm looking for is which interaction between my high voltage and my Tesla coil. I'm going to mess with both of them until I can get a field that goes out, but they're interacting to make this light brighter, but pulse just the way I want it to. So let's go ahead and set it. We're going to be right around, uh, what do I want to say? I'm going to put it right around 40 on my Tesla coil. I have it down the throat with a thicker wire so it has more resistance on the wire so more than last time we're just lit up everything and then we got the same circuit i used this morning for my high voltage and i can turn that up and down so let's see what we get at first and then i'll just up my choice tesla coil so not much of a feel right here not many or many sparks on that which is good Go. We're about 40 on my chest to call right now. I got a field growing right here. Make sure we can see this. You can see I'm pulling it out right now. Right about right there. So our field strength's going out to there. Not bad. 
You can see as I get closer, it pulses with the disc. Let's go ahead. See, I just turned up my high voltage coil a little more. I'm getting less of a signal right there. So we turn it down. Oh, it's going in closer. It's pulling it in. Okay, let's go down just a little bit. The field's now less out here and more concentrated in here. So I'm hitting I'm hitting a layer in between both is what's going on. So you see the field right there it looks pretty good up close. Right here, we still got a good field right there, it's still pulsing. Right there is about the end of my field. And we're about 39 inches. And I'll just verify that measurement in a minute. Right there is about the field that I like. Uh, probably in there just a bit more. So let's go ahead and adjust a little bit more. And turn down my high voltage one more time. That's got a great field going in it now. I found it. I absolutely found it. I found the field. What you're witnessing is something special here, guys. I'm turning down the high voltage to pull it back in. I'm using the Tesla coil on the top and bottom disc to push the field out. I have found my interaction point. I have actually put this field together. So I can test it just like Alexi tells you to test it. You have to adjust the high voltage. You have to adjust the Tesla coil. You have to make everything interact with the disc. I'm doing that. I have found the correct field. I know, you know, some of you out there say, well, it's not connected the exact way Alexi did it. And I understand that. And I think there's a reason for that. You know, every inventor has their way of hiding something. Every time you look, they hid something in there that if you didn't do the test, you'd never understand it. And it would always tell you, oh, well, this doesn't work together. When doing the test, we found the answer. I clearly found it here. There's no getting around it. I found the field, and I found how to make the field work. So what's so significant about this is that every time I do this, I may be putting in a little bit more voltage because of the way it's run through my Tesla coil, but what it's doing is, is it's causing a beat rate to go through the whole craft. And I'll show that a little later when I show the motor speed part, but I'm creating a beat field throughout the entire thing. And what the crazy part is, is as you pull in the high voltage or the static field, it pulls right back into the Tesla field. And then I can overshoot it. So it pulls in too far. And then you see my light go ahead and dim a little bit. And then when you see I pull it out again, I'm changing it again. Guys, this is one of those things where you have to pause and look at it and watch it again. I have created such a field they can now be maneuvered between the two devices in order to get my interaction point. I have found exactly what I was looking for, and now it works perfectly. So now that I know I have my field perfect, let's take a look at an anomaly that's going on. I get a voltage dump, and it's because... On the top part, you see I put the shiny stuff on there. It's just aluminum tape. It doesn't go around the full bottom. The bottom has basically, for lack of a better term, a three-inch hole in it where the actual frame does not connect on the bottom. It just goes to plastic. So I don't have a metal part that goes 
on the bottom there. And you, what you'll find is, is I get a voltage dump out of it. I'm getting a lot of the field that pushes out the very bottom. Is this significant in the whole thing? At this point, I don't know. But I do know it's there. So, yeah, you can see the wires are connecting. The wires go to it. But it's pretty obvious when the thing's right under it. It'll just light up like daylight. It, it really puts out a lot going down straight to the bottom. This right here, you can see the light. It looks like a strobe light in person. Here it doesn't look like it's much of an effect, but you can still see it. This right here is going with the beat frequency of the upper disc, the whole thing. It is now taking it because I put the high voltage in the center plate. It is now taking the Tesla field and it's run one frequency instead of multiple frequencies like we had before where the bottom would be different from the top. Now it's all the same. When I turn the motors up, it speeds up the whole thing. When I turn the motors down, it slows down the whole thing. This is probably one of the most significant parts of this besides creating the field. I now have a unified beat frequency in this whole craft. I have aligned the whole beat frequency of the entire craft together. So what you're looking at is I'm going to change the motor speed and as I do the beat frequency of the craft changes. You'll see the light actually flicker and it'll go faster and then it'll go slower as I change the motor speed. Everything is tied in together, the top, the bottom, both rotors, and the actual field on the outside. You can see it slowing down. Right here, I slowed down the motor. Now both motors are tied together, so every time I change the top rotor, I change the entire craft beat frequency. The Tesla coil and the high voltage both change the same. So what you're getting now is exactly what Alexi did. I can now change the beat frequency with the top rotor. The high voltage and the Tesla coil are now putting out Hertz frequencies. They are under 20 Hertz. Now we're getting somewhere. The center plate is also polarized now. And what's going on as well that you can't see here is that the vibration of the craft is vibrating that helmet to the right. It also has EMI everywhere. So the speakers in the background will actually start to make some sound. Let's take a moment to look at what we did today. We started with an anomaly. We started by just doing some simple tests to find out what's going on with our Tesla coil and our high voltage. What we found was that when we put the wire from the center plate of our gravity flyer down the throat of our Tesla coil, we get an anomaly. At the top four inches, we get something that's different. We get a Hertz frequency. Now, our Tesla coil itself runs in the kilohertz. So to get a Hertz frequency, it just kind of blows you out of the water. So. What was that Hertz frequency doing there? Well, we determined that it was our top plate making that Hertz frequency. Now, that's so important to understand that. Now, we went from that to we started testing everything that we could. We test how much static electricity is going into this thing, how that we can convert our high voltage to a more static volt. Now, in doing that, we also had to push it very far. We pushed everything to its limits by running super amounts of high voltage to this thing. We took our Tesla coil and we ramped it up to a high level by connecting it differently. What did we end up doing? We decided on a very simple path. We wanted to connect this thing to make two fields, two fields that interact. So when we put them together, they interact. That's what we were looking for the whole time. So how did we get there? We d I decided to go ahead and do this. Let's put the Tesla coil field on the top and the bottom. We'll run one wire from the top, all the way continuous, all the way through the throat of our Tesla coil, and all the way to the bottom. What did that do? It changed the beat frequency of everything. Everything went 
to the top disc. It no longer changed from top to bottom the beat frequency. It now put the beat frequency in everything. As soon as that high voltage field went on that center plate, it unified everything. When I tell you this thing is completely interacting with everything, it, it, you cannot separate one part from another. This is what I mean. When you have a beat frequency that goes into your high voltage without it being connected to your high voltage, you have it in your motors without the motors being connected to any of the Tesla coil or the high voltage, yet the beat frequency from that motor controls it all. It is all interconnected. It's so amazing to see it work together. We saw at the end how I got the field to start to work. As we took that light, you could see it. We could move it in, we can move it out. And we saw where the interaction point was. Why? Because it lit up so much brighter at the edge of that interaction point. That was the point where they're interacting. You saw me constantly turn down the high voltage, not turn it up. I needed to turn it down. I needed it to pull it back in. Every time that I did that, what is the one thing that you probably didn't notice right away? Is that I polarized my center plate. That is a significant gain in this. I polarized my center plate. In order to make anti-gravity, you must first break from gravity and create your own. That is the point where you know you have it. I created a polarization in my plate, pulling it in. And I showed that the high voltage itself was pulling it in. Now, the Tesla coil field is pushing it out got my interaction point. I got my polarization. I have everything that I need to create a magnetosphere around this craft. What am I getting? EMI. Why does that make me so happy right now? Because just like you see with our earth, we put it out. We put out a, mag a magnetosphere. What is that? It seems like it's magnetic, right? But what is it really? It's polarization in a high voltage field. That's what it is, guys. That's why I'm so happy right now, because I did the same exact thing in this craft. Now, will the fields have to get more intense? Sure, probably. But right now, I'm just happy with what I have now. I have a field that works, that pulses, just like our Earth does. I have a point in the center where it pulls in, so I can now pull in my field. I have also a push out field, exactly the way our magnetosphere works. This is how we create fields around the craft. Guys, this is so significant. I can't even tell you, I could probably sit down and write a book on how to create fields around a UFO craft. This is exactly where we needed to be, but I'm not done. This craft has to lift and it has to work. And I know that. I now have to go into the harmonics portion of it. We saw in our center disc that we were getting a lot of different frequencies. Now we have to play with our piezo disc in order to amplify some of those frequencies. Which one is it? I'm not sure. There's a lot there. I usually pull out about six that I look at and say, okay, these are points that show up continuously that have a very high arc in them, that we know that it's there. Now, if I can take that piezo disc and I can match one of them or more of them or change between one of them or however it's going to work, I'm going to find my amplification point. Now, I know Jared, or as you guys probably know, my T-Brain has done a lot of work on this. And guys, I think he's nailed it. If I can just take what he did in his craft and put it into mine, I think we're going to have something that lifts. But... The point of this video was the fields, guys. And that's exactly what I needed to create. And I did it. Now, I don't know how to show it where you can see the field as a visual thing. There's a couple more tests I'd like to do. A fog machine is one of them. I want to see if it actually shows it. I want to see if I can put it outside, if I can have wind interact with it. And if it shows any bit of a bubble in there. Can I get anything on the inside, like a leaf or something, or a feather that would actually float in there? Okay, any little point that I can see this field in any significant way 
is going to prove 100% that I have it. I know that I have it, but it's hard to see if you're not standing here next to me. So I'm going to have to find another way to show this. Maybe it's a vacuum chamber. Maybe the vacuum chamber will show my field interaction. I don't know yet. I still have a lot of testing to do, but I'm very proud of the field that I made, guys. I made this thing that it'll work. It consistently works. Every time that I turn it on, I can make it work. So there's just a little bit more testing to go, but we definitely nailed something here. We definitely got this thing working. We definitely have one more step done. And this whole thing, well, this whole project will actually come together beautifully once we get the harmonics in it. So I'm excited. You can tell I'm excited. I'm happy. We got this thing going. Guys, thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you like what you saw here today, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. And have yourself a great day. Thank you.